Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Ask someone of a certain age if the future is here yet, or if not, how they'll know when it's arrived. And there's a good chance this sound is running through their mind. Jackson. No, not the theme song itself, but the high-pitched whine of the Jetsons' signature flying car. For whatever reason, from the Jetsons to Blade Runner to other fictional futures, utopian or dystopian, the flying car is a staple, a visual signifier that lets you know We're in a world far more advanced than our own. And yet, at the same time, it's 2024. We all kind of figured we'd have flying cars by now, right? Well, it turns out that we do. If you have the money, you can buy yourself a flying car right now. What you can do with that flying car, however, is another story. And what happens if you crash that flying car? That's complicated. But the future has arrived, finally. And it's a bit of a mess. But isn't that always the way it goes? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Jeff Wise is a New York-based science journalist who specializes in aviation and technology. He's also the host of the podcast Finding MH370. Hello, Jeff. Hi, good morning. I'm so glad we're talking about this today because this is an incredibly fun story. Well, thank you. Why don't you start with uh, telling us about Tim Lum? Who is he? What's he like? What does he do every day? Well, Tim Lum is an interesting guy. He is retired. He had a hardworking career. He was in the military. Then he was a smoke jumper fighting wildfires. And so now he lives in the mountains in central Washington state. He lives up around 10,000 feet and he looks out over this valley and it's very lovely. He, He lives in a house that he built himself. He's retired. He's divorced. He has no kids. As he puts it, he got out of the divorce unscathed. So he's financially in really good shape. And so For fun, he has this device called a black fly, which is an eVTOL, which is an electric vertical takeoff and landing craft. Uh, You might think of it as a flying car or an air taxi, something like that. It's a little little, uh, futuristic device, sort of like what the Jetsons had. And he, every morning he gets up and when it's nice and calm, he takes off, he hovers up into the air and he zooms off. And he, and he goes scooting over the, the ridges and down into the valley and he visits his friends and he sightsees. And the aircraft only has about 12 minutes of flying time. So he can't go very far. But in those 12 minutes, he's, he's like a bird. He's free. He can just take to the air. Okay, so he's in a flying car. You gave me a more technical term. You got to describe it a little better for us so we can picture him doing this. <laughs> Oh, man, you guys don't have video on this audio podcast. That's a shame. (laughs) So it looks like a a bean pod, sort of like a giant lima bean. And it's got rotors um, on on the edges, and it sort of tilts a little bit. So when he climbs in and then the, the rotors start to lift him up into the air, he kind of pivots forward. So the company that makes it is called Pivotal, maybe for that reason. And it's not much bigger than him. It's, it's just a little like capsule in which he sort of floats around in the air. So flying cars are here now. Like they've arrived uh, at least for 12 minutes at a time. How did that happen? How did I miss it? I feel like we've been promised these things for decades and now some people have them and I've never heard of them. Isn't that crazy? I mean, there's been so much press and publicity and just hype, frankly, about these flying cars. And famously... All these tech people have been saying, well, where's, where's my flying car? Where's the future that I was promised? This is such an emblematic symbol of the future as we imagined it. 
And for years and years, people have been frustrated that we don't have it. Well, now we do have it, in a sense. There's a bit of a asterisk next to that. Because you can buy a flying car now. And you can, and if you don't have enough hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a flying car, you can rent time. You can go visit a spot and pay some money and get a little lesson and up you go. That's pretty exciting, right? So how come there isn't more fuss about this, given that yes. people, have been, people have been banging their fists for all decades, literally saying, where's my flying car? Now you have your flying car. Aren't you satisfied? Or have you just immediately moved on to the next thing? The answer is that there's a caveat, which is that these things operate in a sort of obscure corner of the aviation regulation domain. Here in the United States, every, all of this is administered by an organization called the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. Right. They make sure that aviation is safe. Now, as you know, aviation is incredibly safe. There hasn't been a fatal commercial airline accident in the United States in over a decade. And if you look at worldwide statistics, it's, it's very safe. There are obviously still fatal crashes here and there, but it's very, very safe. Why is that? Because regulators take it very seriously. If you want to take paying customers up in a commercial airliner, there is a thick, thick book of regulations that you have to follow. It covers everything from how much rest the pilots have to get to what kind of documentation you need to have on your spare parts, et cetera. None of those rules apply in a really obscure corner that's intended for tiny little aircraft. It's called Part 103. And it's sometimes more colloquially known as ultralight aviation. Now, if your aircraft weighs less than 254 pounds, you can do whatever you want. Really, anything you want, nobody cares. Well, there's some, there are some restrictions. In addition to it being less than 254 pounds, it's not allowed to go faster than a certain amount of speed. You're not allowed to operate it over cities and so forth. But as long as you kind of keep off into your own little domain, you know, fly it out of your farm or whatever, then you can do whatever you want. Okay, so why aren't we seeing more of these? First of all, how much do they cost? And then second... What is the catch, I guess, that is uh, still in the way of these proliferating? Okay, so we talked about Tim Lung at the top. And he was the first person to buy an EV tall, a, a flying car. And he is a sort of a special person. As I mentioned, he's retired. He has lots of free time on his hands. He has plenty of money. He doesn't have too many dependents who are going to worry if he kills himself. Ultralight aviation is basically a kind of an expression of the libertarian ideal of like, you can go do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody else in doing it. So you're not going to crash a large aircraft into somebody's home. Right. If you crash an ultralight into someone's house, you'll probably bounce off. You'll die. Your, your little ultralight cra craft will be, you know, totaled, but no one else will be hurt. So Tim Lum can, can, can do something like that. I can't, I probably can't. I, 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 I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars that you need to buy one of these things. I have a wife and kids that, you know, presumably would be put out if I was to kill myself. And the other thing is it's only got, it only can have one seat. And one of the things that makes flying fun is to take people flying. You know, it's like walk, looking at a sunset. It's, you can see the most magnificent sunset in the world. And if you're only seeing it by yourself, it kind of doesn't really hit in my estimation. I fly apart in small planes for fun. So there's a lot of things that are, you know, holding it back as a business in that it doesn't really have any practical applications. It's designed not to have practical applications. The FAA doesn't want this to be something that people adopt widely. It is a rec form of recreation that is, as part of its core premise, quite likely to kill you. There you, nobody's going to come check as to whether your screws are tightly attached. No one is going to check if you, ha if you know what you're doing. You don't have to take a pilot's license, right? Look, there's a big, big difference here between can and should. To get into an aircraft of any kind without having <laughs> even rudimentary instruction is a great way to kill yourself. And I know people who have killed themselves building and flying these kinds of planes, which is very unfortunate, but true. And so this is the kind of central conundrum of EV tolls as they exist today. Yes, you can buy an EV toll. Yes, you can go and rent and have a flight in them. But they are so highly restricted 
that the business model for them is pretty dubious. So what does the FAA have to say about uh, the existence of these things and the possible, eventually, proliferation of them? Like, I assume that if these are ever going to become widespread, they will have to be a lot more regulated than what you just described. I think that's exactly right. And the reason that they exist in the space that they do is that there are enormous technical hurdles to reaching full regular certification of these aircraft to the level of safety that other aircraft are certified. Give me some examples if you can. Well, the main one is this. If you're going to run an aircraft off of a battery, it's very hard to achieve the energy density in modern contemporary batteries such that you can stay in the air for very long. Gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel, whatever form it takes, has a very, very, very high energy density per pound, right? And batteries are much lower. And so the FAA likes aircraft to be able to have a reserve of time. So if I fly from here to someplace an hour away, I should have another half hour or 45 minutes of extra flying time so that if my airport is socked in or what have you, I can go somewhere else. Now, with these electrically powered vertical takeoff aircraft, they have such a small amount of energy on board that they only fly for about 15 or 30 minutes. And so you've got, you've basically used up all of your reserve just in taking off in the first place, or even you're, you're actually at a deficit. And so how are you going to get to that level, even on that one particular aspect of safety, how are you going to operate with a safety margin? So there's enormous technical hurdles that remain unless you just start throwing out safety regulations. Who are the companies working in this space and what do they say about how they'll get to uh, widespread use or profitability? Well, that is a great question. And, you know, with the kind of tech startups, a lot of the times that that sort of practical consideration is second tier. It's more about, well, we've got this vision, we have this product, you know, invest in us. Now, you talk to these, there's two companies. One is called Pivotal, and they are selling aircraft. And the other is called Lyft, and they are renting time in aircraft. And neither of them is actually under 254 pounds. They have sort of ways around that. They kind of, their, their lawyers kind of wrote them a letter kind of explaining why they don't have to meet that requirement. Um, the, there's a bit of a catch-22 with the FAA in that because they don't care about Part 103, they specifically say, if you do this, you're on your own. We're not going to check your aircraft. We're not going to check your credentials. If you crash, we're not going to come check the, you know, the wreckage. We don't care. We're going to essentially wash our hands of all this. Because that's their attitude, they don't take a very proactive stance of checking to see whether these vehicles really meet their criteria that they've set forward. So they don't really have a structure for them to pay attention to this stuff. And so I talked to various people in the industry about what is going to be the fate of these aircraft, because I don't think they actually really are legally operating under Part 103. I think they sort of flout various, you know, conditions of the, of the category. But nobody cares because there's only a handful of them and there's no practical use right now. Nobody has killed themselves yet. Nobody has filed a lawsuit yet. I think that's going to be the triggering event when, 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 when lawyers start to get involved. But yes, the fact that there's only a few of them is, is definitely part of it. These companies want to be successful. They would love to see hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of these things flitting back and forth. Right. When that starts to happen, then they're going to start to get scrutiny. And people are saying, well, I mean, I may not be living in a congested area, but I am, I do have rights and I want to not be crashed into by this thing that's zipping overhead and has no, nobody's really been looking very carefully at it. And nobody's been looking carefully at the pilot. It's all kind of wing and a prayer, literally. What comes next for the technology? Because, you know, we're sort of talking about it now as this technology exists. Where does this go from here? And at what point is there a tipping point where this becomes something the FAA needs to look at and something that an ordinary person might want to purchase for more than like 
fun. People oftentimes like a technology because it's cool. And that's it. It's just cool. There might not be a business case for it. There might not be really the technology sufficient to make it practicable. And so this sometimes technology kind of lives on, never actually reaching fruition. And I think that the flying car is one of those where we just want it to work without any rhyme or reason. We just want it to be real. There's so many impediments to this. Yes, batteries are getting better and better, but they're not getting better and better fast enough that we can see a battery-powered aircraft crossing the Atlantic or powering a helicopter for hours at a time or even carrying multiple people. There's been billions and billions of dollars of investor money that's been pouring into this sector. But sometimes you, you, you look at this kind of behavior and you wonder, how rational is this investment? Right. Well, and what what does a future use case for these things kind of as they exist now or in the near future look like then? Like besides the hobbyists that have them, like what else? One use case that has been very publicly promoted is the idea of using these as a sort of last mile air transport device. So basically you could land, you could fly into a, an airport, say you fly into San Francisco. Uh, and then you get out of your plane and you walk across the tarmac and you hop into one of these things. Maybe it's, it's automated and it just kind of like an elevator kind of transports you across San Francisco Bay to your destination. Right. And it doesn't have to take you too far. It's going over water. So it's cutting like it's turning a 90 minute trip into a five minute trip or something. That makes sense as a business model. Now, would you be able to scale it sufficiently? that it would be able to provide a function that would be significantly different from what a helicopter can do. This is the thing. It's if, if there is actually a kind of air category of aircraft that does pretty much what these things do. It's called a helicopter. And it's a very, helicopters are cool. They're amazing aircraft, but they're noisy. They take up a fair amount of, of room. They're expensive. And it's always, when people are promoting a new technology, it's very easy to say, well, it's going to be very quiet. It's going to be very cheap. It's going to be very safe. All of those things are, are great to say in the abstract. But when you actually produce, when you get into the real world is when you actually start to make noise. You actually start to uh, incur failures and, and have crashes. Mm -hmm. And so all the great promises you make when the technology is just on the drawing board may not pan out. When you think about... The idea, I guess, of flying cars and what they have been to us for decades now, how do you feel about the reporting that you've done and, and where, where it meets that? I, you could, I think, fairly label me as a skeptic of this technology. And, I, and I'm a skeptic even though I, too, I mean, I write about this stuff because I think it's cool. I, I like aviation. I like flying. I like the thrill of being up in the air. I think what Tim Lum does every day is really cool. The question of whether what Tim Lum does is something around which you can build an industry is another question. Right. And there's lots of cool technologies, airships. I mean, I love airships. I've, I actually have some stick time in a, in a Zeppelin. Wow. But Zeppelins are never going to be a thing. I wish that they were. I, lo I, would, I would be the first one in line to buy a Zeppelin if it was possible. But there's just so many practical reasons why that's not going to happen. But I've been led to believe that one day I will look out my window and see hundreds of these things flitting their way to various offices across the city. Uh, the end of traffic, the end of uh, waiting for public transportation, not going to happen. Well, it's great to dream a dream, isn't it? I would like to have a personal submarine, too. Let me add that to the list. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and often, I mean, here's the thing. It's like you could, <laughs> you could fly in your personal little mini flying machine across the city and get there in five minutes. But like, what if we had functional public transport? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, there's, there's all kinds of, of, of simpler ways to get the same job done. And the idea that, that these flying cars are going to offer a significant number of people a significant utility 
is daft, actually. It's, it would always be a rich person's toy. And especially if you can only have one seat, it's, ju- it's, it's, very, it's a very, very small use case. But it lives on. It will li- it's, al- it's, it's almost kind of a zombie technology in a sense in that people love it so much that they will always get excited about the latest iteration to come down the pike. And, and it's, it's frustrating as somebody who's been in this sector for a long time. I mean, I've been writing about aviation for a long time, and I've been writing about flying cars for a very long time. And it's like everyone else <laughs> that's covering this stuff is is, is, a, is a newborn. <laughs> like they've never they've never heard this pitch before. Right. And so I'm like this jaded, grizzled old, you know, old school journalist, uh, haggard, uh, you know, ink stained. And I and I see the same kind of promise be made over and over again. Now I got excited because yeah, they're actually flying. I mean, kudos to them. They've actually got this thing in the air. They've managed to sell some. Uh, people are actually you know, selling rides. I'm I'm excited about that part. I think it's cool. And if they can, and if people are willing to burn enough money to keep this little sector small enough that they can they can do it, you know, legally with a small customer base that is really suited to this kind of activity, I'm all in. I'm all for it. Well, for now, I'm just glad to know that they exist. I guess. Uh, so thanks, Jeff, for telling us about them. Yeah, I mean, you're welcome. I'm sorry that it's that the news isn't better. I wish I was, you know, showing up at your doorstep with a big gift wrapped box. This is still better than most of the news we cover. <laughs> Jeff Wise, writing about the future in New York Magazine. That was the big story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Drop us an email at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca with any feedback or story ideas or just call us up at 416-935-5935 and talk it out on a voicemail. Joe Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is our producer. Matt Kesselman is our sound designer. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our audience development lead. Diana Kay is our business manager. And I'm, of course, Jordan Heath-Rawlings, your host and executive producer. Thank you so much for listening. we got a couple of treats in the feed for you, including a new In This Economy this weekend. And we'll be back with a fresh big story on Monday. We'll talk then.